morning to you. It is good to be here today. Uh, we are continuing our verse-by-verse study of uh, 1 Timothy in this, uh, this book that's given to us in the New Testament, really a letter uh, written by the Apostle Paul to a young, uh, struggling pastor named Timothy. So if you have your Bibles, I would love for you to go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. That's where we're going to find ourselves uh, today as we continue our study. And if you've been here uh, through really the course of these last few weeks as we've been going through this series, then you know that the theme of uh, 1 Timothy is this, and this is point number one in your, in your outline, is that 1 Timothy is all about uh, living the gospel life in the family of God. That that's what 1 Timothy is all about, living uh, the gospel life in the family of God. In other words, what does it look like for us to live as believers, as live as Christians who carry the message of Jesus uh, within the church? And when I speak about church, I'm not just talking like, you know, the building that we come into and worship, but really that we are called to be a part of a movement, that we are disciples in Jesus. And so what does it look like to live our lives, the gospel life, really, as disciples of Jesus? It's an important theme that we've come to every week, that we've said every week, and we will repeat every week that we're here. And the reason that we repeat this theme every week is because we hope in months from now or even years from now, when you're thinking about how is it that I'm to live, what does it look like to to live within the church, to function within the body that God calls us to be a part of? What does that look like? That you'll remember that 1 Timothy is all about that. And that you can go and search God's scriptures uh, for the answers that you're looking for. So the reality is is that when it comes to 1 Timothy, that this letter is written to a pretty dysfunctional church. And the reality is is that every church has a level of dysfunction, right? There's no perfect church because every church has people. That's just the way it is, right? And all of us people are sinners. And so every church has issues. And Paul writes this little letter to us, and he writes it in hopes that we will use it for our own instruction of how to function together, of how to live out this gospel life, of, of really to, to look at this and say, this is, this is what it means to be a believer. That Paul says as much in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and so I want to read this together. It's going to appear on the screen, and I'm going to read this, and it's going to have some words underlined, and I want you to read those with me, all right? And so Cole, let's throw this up on the screen here. This is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. This is really the theme. It says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. It was extremely important for the, or to the Apostle Paul for us to live out this gospel, this message of Jesus in the churches that we are a part of. And specifically, it was important for Paul because of what was going on in Ephesus. That Paul had started this little church in this town of Ephesus some many years before. He had been traveling on his missionary journeys with a couple of buddies, one of them being Timothy, and he got word that the church in Ephesus was struggling. And there were several reasons why this little church was struggling. One of the reasons was just the culture that surrounded it. That in Ephesus, on one side of the church, was this temple dedicated to emperor worship. That people would come all over from the known world to to come and to worship the emperor in this temple. On the other side of town was one of the seven wonders of of the known world. It was the temple of Artemis, the sex god of the Greeks. And people would come from all over the known world to worship and to participate there in temple prostitution. And and that people would be coming into this city all around to go to one of these two temples, to either worship the emperor or to worship the goddess of sex. And so this church is in the middle, and they're trying to figure out what does it look like to live out the message of Jesus in a world like this. And then to add complexity on top of that, the church was dysfunctional. They had a few church leaders who were causing some problems. They were teaching uh, things that were not right. They were leading people astray. And word gets to Paul as he's on a missionary journey that this kind of stuff is going on in this church. And so he sends Timothy, this young pastor, in and says, Timothy, I want you to go in and to lead this church in the ways that are holy and right. And so Timothy lands there. And after being there a short time, Timothy realizes he's a bit in over his head. And so Paul, being his mentor, sits down. And he begins to write this little letter to him. And in it, he encourages Timothy. And in it, he says, this is what it looks like to lead the church. Here's here's the things that you're dealing with, the issues that you're facing. Let me help you address these. And so as we've walked through this series together, we've noticed a few things already through these first three weeks. In week one, we looked at this amazing relationship, this unique relationship that Paul and Timothy shared. 
that they, they classified it as a father-son relationship, even though they were not blood. Week two, we looked at the gospel and the significance of the gospel. And the reality that we as a church are called to protect and to guard the gospel, that we're to be about sound doctrine and what that looks like. Last week, if you were here, you remember that we looked at the gospel in a more personal way. We looked at the story of Paul, this remarkable story that reminds us that no one is beyond the reach of God. That God is long-suffering for sinners, that Christ came into this world to save sinners. That God's grace and his mercy is available to everyone. Even those people who think that because of the way that they lived or have not lived, that they are too bad to be loved by God, that nobody is outside the reach of God. And as we turn from chapter 1 to chapter 2 today, with Paul having set the foundation of the gospel for us, he gets into the practical application. He begins to specifically talk to us about what does it look like to live this gospel life in the family of God. And so if you have your Bibles, chapter 2, we're going to read just the first seven verses together. Here's what Paul writes to Timothy, starting in verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 5. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling you the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. That very simply, as we approach this passage today, this passage is all about prayer. It's all about prayer. There's nothing really fancy here. There's nothing really complicated here in the text. That for most people, this passage is, is, is pretty easy to see, pretty clear to understand. And the issue that we will face today as we walk through this passage together is not clarity or understanding, but rather obedience to it. That the issue for us as we approach this passage today is our ability to apply it to our own lives. In just a quick moment of transparency between me and you, that these last couple of weeks, as I've read through this passage multiple times, as I prepared this week uh, for this sermon today, there have been moments of deep conviction in my own life of not living out this passage the way that Paul expects us to live out this passage. Not living out this passage as a pastor, as a follower of Jesus, the way that Paul asked us to live out this passage in chapter 2. And I just figure today that, that if there's one other person who's like me in this space, who sh- will struggle living this out, or maybe has not lived up to the standard that's placed here, then, then maybe we just ought to just take a moment and just pray to God. That God would soften our hearts, that we'd hear what he has to say for us today. And that we would be able to move through this text with full obedience to the way that Christ is calling us to live. And so if you would just bow your head, I just want to pray for a moment for us. Father, Lord, as we approach your word today, God, I pray that you would would ultimately soften our hearts. For everyone who is here, for me, Lord, that that you would take away the hardness and that you would replace that hardness with with tenderness to hear your instruction. God, we are a people who, who want to walk with you, not in reluctant ways, but Lord, with complete joy. Lord, we want to be satisfied by you. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that as we as we move into this text that you would allow us to feel the weight of Paul's words upon our shoulders. Lord, the significance that prayer plays in our own lives and prayer specifically for others. Lord, help us embrace the right motive. Lord, help us have have a clear mind to understand the words today. And Lord, help us live out these instructions in ways that ultimately bring glory to you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. As Paul moves into the practical of this book of 1 Timothy, 
he focuses on the importance of prayer. And very interestingly, as he focuses on this importance of prayer, he ties it to something he said earlier in his writings. Look at verse 1 with me. He says, first of all, then, and that then is really a therefore in the Greek. And the therefore signifies for us that he's not saying something new, but he's actually concluding a thought that he had previously somewhere else. That this isn't just a a random command that Paul pulls out. It's not a new command. It's a command with context. It's a command with, with something that's already been said. That this is a conclusion to a point that he's already made. And so if we wander back up into chapter 1, specifically in verse 19, we see that Paul charges Timothy. And he says, Timothy, I charge you to hold on to the faith and to have a good conscience and to avoid the things that will shipwreck your faith. And then in verse 20, what he does is he gives us a couple of examples of church leaders, really these yahoos, who are doing just that. They are shipwrecking their faith. In other words... What Paul is saying is that if, if you reject a good conscience, you will shipwreck your faith. Or another way for us to say it is this way. If you want to make sure that your faith stays afloat, don't do the things that condemn or fail your conscience. And what Paul is getting at here is probably something that every one of us would agree with, that there is a correlation between a good and clear conscience and the faith that we have. That a good conscience and a vibrant faith, they go hand in hand. Let me give you an example. It's a small example, but, but I think it will help you. That one of the things that we're asking everyone to do at Crossroads Church throughout this whole series is to read through 1 Timothy. We're asking you to read just a chapter a day. There's six chapters. Choose six days a week. Read a chapter a day. Over the course of this series, if we all do that together, we will have read through 1 Timothy 13 times together. And the reason that we're asking everyone to participate in that at Crossroads is because we really, really, really believe that spending time in God's word, soaking in his word, meditating upon his scriptures, even the same passage for a long period of time deepens our love for Jesus. That the more we know his word, the deeper it penetrates into our soul, the more affection we have for our Savior. We just believe that. We just believe that. And so we're asking you to read a chapter a day through the course of this series. Now, as one of your pastors, as a leader of this church, if I was to fall into the habit of not reading 1 Timothy every day, like I'm asking you to read 1 Timothy every day, then my conscience would fire, wouldn't it? And my conscience would say something like this, Matt, you talk about how beneficial it is For everyone to be in God's word, to to dwell in his word, even in in a passage for a long period of time, and how that deepens our affections for God. And you're not doing it. All this talk about relationship with God and the value of the word, it's fake. If you believe that, you wouldn't go on doing this. You wouldn't forget to do this. If you believed what you were saying, You would seek Jesus more deeply like you're asking the people of Crossroads Church to seek Jesus more deeply. You hypocrite. That's the way the conscience works, right? And when my conscience fires that way, I have an option of one of two things, don't I? One, I can either go, man, I am a hypocrite, and begin to work on those things and make changes to those things, showing that my faith is genuine, or I can ignore it and go on with my life. That's the way our conscience works. And what Paul is saying here is that your faith is like a ship and your conscience is like a cannon firing cannonballs into the side of your ship and as those holes fill up in your ship, you have an option that it gets to the point where you can either show your faith genuine by patching the holes and making changes or you can show that your faith was never genuine to begin with, and those holes eventually sink your ship. It's a vivid picture that Paul's painting for us in in verses 18 through 20. And Paul says, look, every single one of us, every single one of us who call ourselves believers, we want a good conscience. That is, where our conscience helps us align our lives with our faith. That's the point of verses 18 through 20. 
And so when we get into chapter 2, verse 1, this isn't a new thought that Paul is giving to us. It's a continuation of everything that he laid out in chapter 1 concerning the gospel, and specifically this charge that he gives Timothy. It would be better to read verse 1 of chapter 2 this way. Since a good conscience is needed in order to keep your faith afloat, therefore, I urge you to pray for all people. That's the priority for Paul. In fact, this is point number two in your outline. That keeping your faith afloat, having a vibrant faith and a good conscience is praying for other people. That's the priority for Paul as he begins to lay out the practicality of the gospel in our lives as we live it out in the body of Christ. And soon after he makes that point, he begins to pile on words around this idea of prayer. Look what he says, verse 1. He first says supplications. You make supplications. Supplications are just petitions before God. The next word he uses is prayer. Prayer is the most general word that we have in the Greek, meaning prayer. And with it, it always carries this idea of devotion and affection, deep intimacy with God. The third word he piles on us is intercessions. That is intervening prayer. Finally, he says you give thanks, be thankful in your prayers. And he piles on all of these words and his intention of piling all of these prayer type of words onto us is for this. is to keep us out of praying general prayers and to rather have us praying particular prayers. That one of the temptations that we fall into as affluent Western Christians is that oftentimes we pray in generalities, don't we? That we pray very general prayers. And Paul says, I don't want you praying general prayers. I want your prayers to be specific. I want your prayers to be particular. In fact, you can look through all of Scripture. You can check this out yourself. That anywhere prayer is modeled for us, whether that is with Jesus or Paul or Peter or James, you look it up. Anywhere that prayer is modeled for us, we are always taught to pray particular, not in the general. And after piling on the comprehensiveness of this prayer, He takes us to the inclusivity of our prayers in such that they should be for all people. It's like Paul is pushing Timothy ever so gently and he's saying, Timothy, I don't want you to pray for people who are just like you. I don't want you just to pray for people who like you. I don't want you just to pray for one group over another group. I want you to be praying for all people. And the point that Paul is making here is similar to the point that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 5. Do you remember Matthew chapter 5? When Jesus is one day, he's out teaching the people, and he says these words to them. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I tell you the truth on this day. Love your enemy and pray for them. The point that Jesus is making in Matthew chapter 5 is the same point that uh, Paul is making here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. There is no category of person. There is no category of person that you should not be praying for. Which every single one of us should then be raising our hands and going, (laughs) Paul, I got a question. What does any of this have to do with shipwrecking our faith? Like, what does praying for other people comprehensively and all people have to do with having a good conscience that keeps our faith afloat? What do these two things have, you know, how do these two things work together in this? How do these two things relate? And I think that Paul would answer it like this. That all of Scripture, all of our Bibles, can be summed up in one verse, Luke 10, 27. Luke 10, 27 says this, Love God with every fiber of who you are, and love people as yourself. All of scripture can be summed up in that one verse. Love God, every part of who you are, and love people as yourself. And what Paul is getting at is at the very moment, the very moment that you begin to do something or become something that is unloving toward people, your conscience starts blowing holes in the side of your ship and threatening your faith. And Paul looks at us and says, come on, come on. What is more loving than coming to your good and great God on behalf of other people? Petitioning, intervening, giving thanks, 
praying with deep devotion for other people. The first thing, and maybe the easiest thing. Look, (laughs) you don't even have to get out of bed to do this, right? The first thing and the easiest thing that you can do in fulfilling the great commandment of Jesus to love other people is to go to God on their behalf. If you're a believer here today, and you want to do the most good for the most people, you want to fulfill the easy way possible, the great commandment of Jesus, you pray for all people. You lift them up to God. Now listen, is there a greater message for the church today? For the world today? I mean, we live in a culture that is absolutely polarized, don't we? From politics to religion to sexuality to race, That our world is full of hate and destruction. We have our entertainment masquerading as news channels with hot takes that seek to divide us for better ratings instead of doing anything good for us. And in the midst of all of this, Paul says, what if the church looked different? What if people from the outside world go, man, the church, they actually pray for people. Like, they pray for each other, and I don't even go to their church, and I heard they were praying for me. And you get, they pray for people who stand against them. What kind of different message would we stand to give to the world if that was the kind of attitude that we lived and we served with? Where the world would look at us and go, in a world of destruction and hate, the church is bringing unity. They're actually praying for people, and I'm not even sure that I believe in this God that they're praying to. But man, can I have some of that prayer? Because I need it in the midst of this world. Paul says, you want to know what it looks like to live the gospel life in the family of God? First, most importantly, you begin to pray for all people. And at Crossroads Church, I just want you to know that we're trying to model this. We try to model this in our corporate worship, that once a month we pray for vocations specifically for vocations. Last week, we prayed for, for government employees. And Pastor James, he, here at the North Glen campus, he did something really cool with that. He said, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna give you 30, 45 seconds to pray for a government employee from, from uh, uh, who's the guy, Del- mail delivery guy, postman, to president. And I was here for three services. So I prayed for my postman, we, you know, this service, Second service, I prayed for every mayor of the cities that we serve in, the mayor of Fort Lupton, Thornton, North Glen. The last service, I prayed for President Trump. But every month, we pick a vocation. We pray specifically for people in those vocations. Once a month, we pray for schools. We left up schools and staff and principals. We, we pray for principals by name. Once a month, we lift up missionaries. We pray for that missionary and the people that they serve and the ministry that they have. Once a quarter, we pray for churches and their pastors because here's what we believe, that other churches, they are not our competition, that we are on the same team and that we need to lift them up in prayer because we want to see the gospel come to this city and impact this city that we try to model corporately in our worship the habits of the heart that lead us individually into deeper relationship with Jesus. That's what we're doing on the weekends when we gather together. That we come together, and this is just a model of what every single one of us should be doing individually as habits that deepen our affections for Jesus. That's the goal when we come together. I could go on about that, but we don't have time, okay? So verse two, all right? After imploring us to pray for all people, Paul takes us more specific, and here's what he says, verse 2. Pray for kings and all of those who are in high places. Now, of all of the people, all of the people that Paul could single out, he chooses to single out those who have governing authority over us, our rulers. And if you were a part of Timothy's church, you would go, what? What? Paul, I don't know if I heard you right. Can you run that by us again? Did you, did you say pray for our rulers like Nero? Him? I don't know if you know this or not, Paul, but, but just down the road here from church is like a big temple. And people, they can go to that temple and they can pray to Nero. They can pray for Nero. They can do whatever prayers they want for Nero down, down the road. And it ain't like Nero's doing us any favors, right? Us Christians. I mean, Rome just burned down. You know that. You're there. 
He blamed us. He's rounding us all up. He's throwing us in the gladiator arena to be eaten by lions. He's having his armies round us up and they're lighting us on fire on the poles in his garden party so they can laugh and mock us. Those are our friends and family. Pray for Nero. Intervene. Petition. Give thanks for Nero. I'll pray for Nero. I'll pray the impeccatory prayers like David prayed for Nero. Throw him off the cliff. Let him burn in hell. What else you got? And looking back on history, that kind of attitude, they've got a point. I mean, humanly speaking, we would have a hard time finding anyone more unworthy of our prayers than Nero. If you were here last week, do you remember we looked at Paul's story? And in Paul's story is a man named Ananias. And Ananias is ultimately the, the person who, who helped Paul understand and see all of who Jesus was. And Jesus comes to Ananias in a vision, and he says, This Paul I've chosen for him to carry my gospel, my message to the Gentiles. And I'm going to give Paul the opportunity to speak before kings and Paul will know what it means to suffer for my sake and for my message. At the time of this writing, that vision given some 30 years prior is being fulfilled. That sometimes we lose sight of what's going on. Paul is not like cruising the Greek Isles. He's not even living as good as most of us live. In fact, at this moment, Paul is under house arrest, He's raiding his trial before Nero, where he will get his chance to share the message of Jesus before a king. And that emperor will have him put to death, will execute him because of it. This is not lost on Paul. Paul sees what's coming down the road. And he says to us and to the church, you pray you intercede, you give thanks to those who have governing authority over you. Crazy, right? Crazy. That there has to be something that Paul saw that the rest of us sometimes have trouble seeing, something even bigger than life itself. In verse 2, Paul says, You pray for kings and all of those who are in high positions, that we may lead quiet and peaceful lives, godly and dignified in every way. What Paul knew and what Paul trusted in was that God uses rulers and kings and presidents and dictators, saved and unsaved, to accomplish his purposes. That Proverbs 21.1 is it's a great verse when it comes to this issue. And here's what it says. That the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of God. And our Lord moves it any way he pleases, any way he wills. When we're having trouble in our culture with Nero, that verse is a great reminder for us. That Paul's commands is that we pray for rulers, not because they are believers, but because our God reigns. And the implication of this truth is that God is able to do so much through them, which at the forefront of Paul's mind is bringing peace and tranquility into our lives. That Paul believes that even a bad ruler is better than anarchy. Even a bad ruler can, can keep the peace. And so he says, you pray for kings so that we might live peaceful lives. Now we have to be careful here. Because if we end in verse 2, then we miss the point. We think that the point of our prayers is just for peace in our own lives. But that's not the goal. That's not the point. There's something bigger here. Look at verses 3 and 4. He, he focuses us on the motive. Here's what he says. This is good. Peace and tranquility. Dignified lives. This is good. And it's pleasing in the sight of our God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Why do we pray for kings to bring peace into our lives? Because in Paul's mind, peace paves the way for the gospel. 
That peace is the soil in which the gospel flourishes. That peace is not the main thing. Salvation is. Tranquility is not the goal. The knowledge of the truth of God. That's the goal. That we are to pray that every ruler in his day and in his culture, it makes the kind of decisions that create the fertile soil for the gospel to grow, for the gospel of Jesus to bear the most amount of fruit, and that is the salvation for all people. Like, follow Paul's thought here. He says, look, first and foremost, I want you to pray for all people, specifically kings and rulers who are over you, that you may have peace and tranquility so that all people have the opportunity to know Jesus, that this is evangelistic prayer, that Paul is imploring us to pray for people so that they might come to know faith, that we are to intercede that we are to petition, to give thanks, to pray with devotion so that people might know and come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then in verses 5 through 7, he gives us the heart. He gives us the motivation by giving us three essential truths. I'm going to fly through these. First, he says there is one God, verse 5. There is one God. Booming in the background is the thunderous echo of Deuteronomy chapter 6. We call it the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. There is one God. The second thing he says there in verse 5 is that there is one mediator between God and sinful man, and his name is Jesus. Look, every single one of us has sinned. God has created a standard that we are to live to as his creation. And every single one of us falls short of that standard. We call that sin. And in our sin, at times, we try and we fail. At other times, we just look at God and we say, God, we don't want you to be our God. We want to be our own gods. And it is both an affront and extremely heartbreaking to God. And because of our sin, we cannot approach God. And it's the reason why every single one of us at some point in our lives, at some point in our lives, have stared in the dark at night at the ceiling and wondered if God and I, if we're okay. God, are me and you good? If I was to die tonight, am I with you? The reason that every single one of us has had that thought at some point in our life is because we feel the separation that sin has caused. We feel it in our souls. The third thing, and Paul says in verse 6, is that this one mediator, Jesus, gave himself as a ransom for all, that his death avails any and all who place their trust in him. And what Paul is telling us is that we have a mediator in verse 5 who is also our redeemer, verse 6, and that he is providing a payment that every single one of us owe that we could not pay by ourselves. And so Jesus came into this world. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross as ransom for the payment that I could not pay, raising again three days later and offering, offering grace and mercy, life, salvation, reconciliation to every single person who trusts. Now what Paul is saying is, look, that this way is open to all, but there is one way, and that way is through Jesus. And then he gets to verse 7. And he makes this statement about who he is in the apostleship and how he is delivering the message. He says, look, the proclamation, his point is, is the proclamation of this message, the carrying out of this message of the great redeemer that we have in Jesus is one way, is through us. It's through us. That the delivery is through us. That's the plan. That every single one of us are, are called to be evangelists. Maybe not an evangelist like the great apostle Paul. Not maybe an evangelist like, like Billy Graham. But every single one of us are to be an evangelist. And Paul says that that starts when you drop to your knees and you begin to pray for all people and their salvation. Listen, we will not reach the Muslim world without prayer. We will not reach the Buddhists or the Hindus or the Jews or the secularists without prayer. We will not reach our nation, our state, or our city without prayer. We will not reach our neighbors without prayer. And so Paul says, let us join together and cry out for our nation and every nation. Let us pray for the persecuted church and those who are doing the persecuted. 
Let us pray for the unreached and the reached. Let us lift up dictators and presidents and kings and queens that they might provide for us the soil in which the gospel can flourish. Let us pray for those that we like and let us pray for our enemies just as earnestly. And so today as we come to a close, what I want to do is I want to spend just a few moments in prayer together. And I'm going to give you just a few moments where you can lift up whoever you need to lift up. Maybe that's a wayward son or daughter. Maybe that's a friend who you desperately want to see to come to know Jesus. Maybe for some of you, that's our president or one of our mayors or our governor. Whoever it is, I'm going to give you a moment just to live out this passage as we pray together and close our service. Would you bow with me, Father? Lord, first and foremost, as we come to this passage, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. God, my guess is that there's very few of us, Lord, in these rooms today who actually approach prayer with the fervor that you call us to approach prayer with. Lord, praying for the nations of the world, praying for different people groups, praying for, for our leaders and our neighbors. God, oftentimes our prayers are, are consumed with, with health, and Lord, getting us better. And while that is all good and fine, Lord, that that is just a, a small piece of what you're calling us to pray for. And so, Lord, we need your forgiveness for, for those times where we, have, where we have ignored this command to pray earnestly, to pray with petitions and intervening, to give thanks. And so, Lord, I just ask, Lord, that as we, as we seek your forgiveness, that that you would give it to us. You know, we know that you are just. Lord, to forgive us our sins and to clear our conscience. Lord, at the end of the day, we want a vibrant faith. And so, Lord, we would... Lord, we would be wrong not to spend a few moments in this service now lifting people to you. And so, Lord, in just this moment, Lord, we lift names in this room to you now. Father, I know that there are as many names being lifted right now as there are people here at Crossroads Church. Lord, names of wayward sons and daughters, names of city employees and government officials, Lord, names of leaders in this church, people who are ailing and sick, Lord, people who are who are in their unbelief that we desire greatly to come to see and know you and people who are in their belief, Lord, who just need some encouragement. Lord, we lift those names to you, knowing that you are faithful and good to hear us. Lord, this week, as we live out the gospel life, Lord, may we first and foremost drop to our knees every morning and lift these names that you've put on our heart to you. And Lord, may you do good things through them as we seek to love you and love people as ourselves. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, the way that we're going to close our service today is by doing a blessing, um, an old Irish blessing, since today is St. Patrick's Day. And so I'm going to ask if you would stand. And it's our tradition here at Crossroads to stick out your hands as, as I read this blessing over you today. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always be at your back.
May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rain fall soft on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hands. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week. Forever.